British continue their advance to get what they came for, the colonial ammunition stored in nearby Concord. Along the way, detachments of redcoats storm into local homes and ransack for weapons. The word spreads, and militia from all over the area rush toward Concord to head off the British. This time, it's the Americans who are coming. They find not just the Concord militiamen, uh, but all sorts of other militiamen coming and still coming and still coming and still coming. The British are certain they can swat these militia away like pesky flies and find that they cannot, that they've encountered hard-fighting men. The British are badly outnumbered. They are forced to retreat. Sixteen miles separate them from the safety of Boston. Sixteen miles. On foot, they are sitting ducks for armed and angry colonials. It is a trauma they won't soon forget. All the hills on either side of us were covered with rebels, so that they kept the road always lined and a very hot fire on us without intermission. Henry de Bernier, British soldier. Twenty hours of constant barrage bring heavy losses to the beleaguered British. 73 dead, 174 wounded, and 26 missing. The Americans suffer 49 killed, with 40 wounded and 5 missing. By the time British soldiers get back to Boston, the colonials have the city surrounded, with militia from neighboring colonies on their way. Gage and his troops are trapped, with their backs to the sea. The rebels have added insult to outrage. They have possessed the roads and other communications by which the town of Boston was supplied with provisions, and with a preposterous parade of military arrangement they have effected to hold the army besieged. Thomas Gage. Three weeks later, on May 10th, 1775, Benjamin Franklin is back home in Philadelphia, just as the Continental Congress is called back into emergency session. The revolution is on an irreversible course. It will take sturdy leadership from men as different in temperament as the people they represent. Whether they know it or not, these are the men of destiny who will guide the American people into their uncertain future. And these are the men who will shed their blood and give their lives to make it happen. And the militias are certain that they can defeat the British Army because they have this revolutionary fire and spirit. And they argue that one man with that sort of spirit is worth a hundred British regulars. One such man who comes to Massachusetts is a fearless officer from Connecticut. His name, Benedict Arnold. A man intent on doing great things in the coming war. Arnold has a bold military plan for the Patriot cause. When Benedict Arnold marched into the New England camp outside Boston, right after Lexington and Concord, he was spit and polish. And he made such a physical impression, when he sat on a fine horse, he was literally a commanding figure. Men, men looked up to him. The Green Mountain Boys jump at the opportunity to take on the British. Taking separate paths, Allen and Arnold, each with his own orders, head towards Fort Ticonderoga. Arnold is alone, expecting to recruit men along the way. Allen and his men are already preparing the attack. Their paths cross 30 miles from their target. And they put down their guns, and they said they were going to march home, that they would only fight for Ethan Allen. Arnold grudgingly agrees to conduct the raid with these men, but finds himself relegated to second-in-command. It is a humiliating confrontation. In the pre-dawn hours of May 10th, 83 Green Mountain boys and 50 Massachusetts militiamen sneak up on the British stronghold. The 50 sleeping redcoats inside 
have gone undisturbed in the wilderness for so long, they are totally unprepared for what's about to hit them. It's over in minutes. The British soldiers surrender without a fight. The fort's valuable artillery stores now belong to the rebels. Adams urges the immediate appointment of a commander to head up this new army. His Massachusetts colleague, John Hancock, a vain, ambitious man who has just been elected president of Congress, assumes he will be offered this even more important role. His friend Adams is about to nominate him, or so he thinks. And that is a gentleman among us and very well known to all of us. A gentleman whose skill and experience as an officer, whose independent fortune, great talents and excellent universal character would command the approbation of all the colonies better than any other person in the Union. That is the gentleman from Virginia. Hancock is stunned. Adams passes him over for a gentleman planter from Virginia, George Washington. The Continental Congress wanted a national army, not just a Massachusetts army or a New England army. They thought that by getting a commander-in-chief from a, a different colony would balance that. He takes the job for no pay and prepares to leave for Boston to take on the strongest army in the world, not yet knowing that all hell has already broken loose up there in a place called Bunker Hill. These three supporting generals were brought in essentially to supplant Gage, and it became a, a kind of personal contest between these three men as to who would take Gage's position as commander-in-chief in America. How is the odds-on favorite, but an odd choice to take over the command in America? A political liberal, he opposes the king's policies in the colonies and had once vowed not to fight against his English countrymen there. General William Howe was opposed to the war. All they wanted was the Americans to submit to British laws and British taxes. They didn't want to go fight them. Boston, June 16th. In the months since Lexington and Concord, rebel militia in the hills around Boston have laid siege to the city, trapping the British and their loyalists inside. Now the British command is planning to break the rebel stranglehold with an overwhelming offensive up Bunker Hill to take the high ground around Boston. But the colonials are a step ahead of the British. Spies have slipped the British plans to the rebels. Up in the hills, regimental commanders from Connecticut and Massachusetts lead their men to fortify Bunker Hill. Then decide to move one hill closer to Boston on Breed's Hill. There, they dig in for a British attack. Midnight, June 17th. 1,200 militiamen race the clock to beat the sunrise before it reveals their position to the British below. They must control the high ground before the enemy makes its own move. At daybreak, the sleeping British ships in Boston Harbor spot the militia positions and sound the alarm. All of Boston awakens with a start. The Patriots have beaten the British to the punch. The first full battle of the revolution is joined. As the Redcoats assemble for battle, ships in the harbor try to pin down the militia with cannon fire. Under the command of General William Howe, lines of British soldiers, their bayonets at the ready, climb the hill without any cover. Easy targets for a manned and musket that can shoot straight. 
the British are convinced that they can form up in line and despite taking casualties instill in the Patriots fear of a professional disciplined force of regulars and demonstrate to the Americans that this is madness trying to oppose this army. Twice Howe's men charge up Breed's Hill. Twice they are repelled by the militia. From roofs and hilltops, civilians come out to witness the bloodshed. It is war as spectator sport, but many fear for their loved ones in the fight. The rebel barrage goes on for three hours until they run out of ammunition. Despite their advantage, the rebels have no choice but to retreat. The British finally capture the hill on their third charge. The ground is strewn with red-coated bodies. The new commander now realizes what no one in faraway England could possibly understand. This is not a rebellion. This is war. When I look to the consequences of it, in the loss of so many brave officers, I do it with horror. The success is too dearly bought. British General William Howe. The British pay a horrendous price for their victory at Breed's Hill, which erroneously but permanently becomes known as the Battle of Bunker Hill, after the original target. 1,000 of the 2,300 British soldiers, nearly half, are dead or wounded. The Americans lose 271 men out of 1,600. In defeat, the colonists have won. A paradox that over the next six years will come to characterize the Americans' bloody war for independence. Whatever mortal fears Washington harbors, the people he meets on his way to Boston have no such misgivings about the man charged to defend them. The appointment gives universal satisfaction. I was struck with General Washington. Dignity with ease and complacency, the gentleman and soldier look agreeably blended in him. Abigail Adams. Cambridge, Massachusetts. Washington is in for a terrible surprise. Despite their brave defense of Breed's Hill, the men he is coming to command fail even his worst expectations. He really has a task that is absolutely mind-boggling. A dirty, mercenary spirit pervades the whole. Could I have foreseen what I have? No consideration upon earth should have induced me to accept this command. George Washington. The general must start from scratch and personally attend to even the lowliest, most rudimentary functions. His first tasks are fundamentally administrative tasks. His junior officers have to be taught how to fill out a report, how to count men, how to purchase supplies, how to buy tools where to dig a latrine, where to butcher meat, where to bury offal. These are all things that, amazingly enough, Washington has to concern himself with. So the task before him is immense, and it's going to require a tremendous amount of energy to literally whip this army into shape. And the whip will come down hard. Every man will learn discipline by Washington's very strict code for disobedience of orders and damning his officer, to receive 30 lashes on his bare back, for expressing himself disrespectfully, to be stripped of his arms, put in a horse cart with rope round his neck, and drummed out of the army. General George Washington. The new army is stitched together with widely different militias from very different colonies. Each is accustomed to its own command and its own way of doing things. Establishing a common culture is yet another overwhelming challenge.